left Penang at the age of 17 and came back in my mid-40s, about 30 years later. And I think that because I've always lived in the heart of Georgetown, in the core parts of the UNESCO heritage site, the Penang that I left 30 years before and the Penang that I um, came back to was essentially unchanged, physically. I think what was what changed for me was the fact that the intangible heritage of the area, the district that I grew up in, had disappeared. So in one generation, modernization and development had meant that all the practices, not all, but a lot of it had all disappeared. The physical buildings were all still here. They were decaying, but they could be restored. So what could not be restored was people's belief and faith in the cultural and spiritual and religious practices that was going on in the precinct. I basically uh, grew up around here, Mantri Street. My family home was around here in the street. I went to school down the road, so the same street. So I came back to the street where, you know, I grew up in. So 360 degrees, and uh, 30 years later, I ended up in point zero. I grew up, got myself a career, you know, got an education overseas. Well, in my mind, I basically made enough money to do what I wanted to do. I was a professional banker. I was a fund manager, investment manager, uh, based in Australia. And... Uh, you know, that allowed me to have the financial freedom to do what I wanted to do in my middle age. So that was basically what I uh, did in the 30 years. You know, I, I sort of traveled the world. You know, I got myself very much involved in um, doing all the things that I love doing, which is like visiting palaces, castles, European museums, learning about art, life and history. And... Uh, not knowing that it would help me put all that into context when I was uh, doing up um, these Peranakan houses. Having the knowledge base about what period things were, what the design references were about, um, you know, was all preparing me for this moment. Coming back to Penang was the last thing on my mind. Um, you know, when we leave for greener pastures, or what I thought was greener pastures, pastures, you know, you never thought that you end up in point one, in the same spot where you left. I think I would have lost a lot of money if uh, someone had taken a bet with me that I would end up here, the same spot. Um, even my parents were very surprised. I mean, you just can't plan these things, right? You can't plan that... Um, your banking career was going to end and when you're in your early 40s. It ended because I, I made sure that I didn't get another job when my bank was taken over. Uh, it ended because I wanted to see what else there was to do, I, I could do in Asia. I came back because I wanted to get to know my mother again. She was in her 80s and had become widowed and I thought that it was a great chance for me to look after her because I had been away for so long. And while I was doing that, I began to see the beauty of the old Georgetown again. And that was even before UNESCO had inscribed uh, Georgetown as a World Heritage Site. sitting now in this house was the first house I bought and that was about in the year 2006 
and that was like two years before the inscription of, uh, by UNESCO. And even the inscription by UNESCO was a total surprise for all of us. Because I know that we had made, Georgetown Penang had made an attempt to, for inscription in the year 2000 and uh, that was rejected. So I didn't think that they would resubmit again together with Malacca. I thought it was the right time because people were starting to be aware um, and uh, of uh, the inner city, the beauty and the heritage that they had here. Because, and for the first time, one could buy into the heritage area here because they were under the rent control for a long time, for 40, 50 years. And uh, when that was repealed in the year 2000, finally these properties came up for sale for the first time. It was about 2008, inscription of the inscription of uh, the World Heritage Site happened. So suddenly I was quite shocked, but I was very happy because that meant that most of the physical and material assets, architectural assets in Georgetown would be preserved. And there's so much of it that's, that should be preserved. And then, of course, being in the right place at the right time meant that properties popped up for sale right before my eyes. I had a lot of choice. Um, there was one night I had a shopping list because there was this trust that was uh, vested after 50 years. And so the owner wanted to sell everything in this, uh, on that list that he inherited. I think there was about 40 properties there, all in the heritage zone. And uh, so we just went to look around and bought a few properties from that list. And the first one, of course, was Mantri Muse, which was my great-grandfather's garage. It was right next door to the, his house. So that had a lot of connections with me. dropped this box of photos off to me. He said, oh, you know, I think I should be the one to keep them. So I hadn't bothered looking at them until recently. And you know, the black and whites, this is... I looked at them and I thought, I've actually seen these photos before. They were hanging in my great-grandfather's house. When I was a child, I used to go there, and then on the wall was this framed-up photograph of this, you know, all these tiny little photographs. And I always wondered what they were, but I was too scared to ask. And then I saw a coffin on one of them, and I thought, oh my God, how macabre. Why would they want to have photographs of all that in this dining room? But they did. Anyway, now I'm the cheaper and the trustee of these photographs. So it's fascinating because I love just looking at the streetscape, the clothes we were wearing, the cultural traditions of funerals in 1957. That's more than 60 years ago. It's almost 65 years ago. And uh, it's like a different world completely. So it had a lot of emotional connection to me, that uh, Mantri Muse, because I was cycling past that property every morning to school. You know, we went to buy ice there. The first little cubicle was selling ice. You know, there were actually people living right down that whole um, bank of um, cubicles that were meant to be for horse carriages. So 
I think that was very fortuitous coming across that. And, um, you know, one thing led to another. I was uh, looking at this row of terraces after buying Mantri Muse. I was looking at this row of terraces up the road from me, up the road from Mantri Muse. There was a for sale sign out there. It was completely dilapidated, opened up to the elements. And uh, I thought, wow, what a great opportunity. Anyway, this row of property is called, that's, that's called Seven Terraces. to negotiate because it started off being too expensive for what it was and then the market slowly moved up to what they wanted for it and they to be fair they never budged from their price they always stuck on to that price and uh, when it got to that price the market I then agreed to buy it at that price ridiculous you know it was such little money it was ridiculous but um, at that time you know I just didn't want to pay it over the odds because there was nothing left there there was very little left in the property so I just valued it as la for land value and you know for the heritage zone in Georgetown there was really no encouragement and no incentive and a lot of roadblocks a lot of do not come here like signs when uh, you wanted to buy into the heritage zone. And also in those early days, people did not know what the rules were, what the requirements were. I don't know whether I would do it, frankly, if I knew how difficult it was. And it still is. The style of the hotel, basically, I looked at what was unique about Georgetown. Why did people come here? What was unique in terms of the architectural um, inventory here? Georgetown was very much a 19th century mercantile port and you have a lot of merchants' houses, middle-class housing and uh, subsequently when wealth was created, more wealth was created, these houses were decorated uh, to an inch of its life. I think the peak period was the 1920s. So when I looked at these shells, I thought you know, it's obvious that we have to create what was sensitive to the period, what was, what was sensitive to what was here before. And because I grew up in these homes, it was just very natural for me to know how to fit them out, how, they, how the layout, how the house was used. I felt that it was my duty to show people the beauty and the grace and the glamour of these houses when they were done up. Uh, I think, you know, that was my purpose and my dream was to create the Peranakan era or recreate the Peranakan era for travellers to step back in time. In the reception area, you'll find benches, open beds, centre tables and the east-west tables, I call them, or the console tables. So these are examples of what you'll find in your rooms as well. Not all of it, but some of it. Welcome to the gallery where we have several exhibitions each year. And uh, it's from my collection and our uh, things that I've accumulated over time. And uh, 
At right at the moment, we have an exhibition of the 19th century Narnia gilded furniture. One of the unique things in Seven Terraces is its collection of um, black hood and mother of pearl inlaid furniture. We have a huge collection in the public areas and also in the rooms. Um, it's a great archive for people who want to look at these things and uh, I find it incredibly comfortable. I know some people think it's not, but I do. It's very good for your back as well. So wander around and have a take and have a look and take in the feel of what the Gilded period for Peranakan culture was all about. It was in the 1920s. One of my favourite things in Seven Terraces, which I'd like to share with you, is my Kamchen collection. This is one of the things that you mustn't miss when you come into Seven Terraces. I built up and I've, it's on loan to Seven Terraces and there's probably about a hundred Kamchengs in total in one place and I'm very proud of it. Perhaps my most prized um, collection of Peranakan porcelain. One of the unique things of course is our collection of wedding furniture from the Peranakan period and uh, we have several magnificent wedding beds and um, what's called confinement beds um, within the hotel itself and some of them are in your rooms. So these are museum quality and they are unique in their own right. This is our furniture gallery. Everything in here is for sale. Um, look at the whole cabinets of Kamchengs, blue and white Kamchengs, cabinets of uh, blue and white Kitchen Ching, salvaged um, China from the South China Sea. This would be the envy of any auction house. Look at the stock that we have that's for sale. This is a day bed that I've created from my collection of bits and pieces. I would say it's an upcycled um, day bed from uh, my collection of um, wood carvings from the 19th century. Every single piece of carving that you see here is old, but it's framed with new wood. So it lasts at least another 100 years. This is our award-winning restaurant, Kabaya Dining Room. And we have the most fabulous over-the-top drapes that uh, we created for the room. And I know they look a little bit too new, but in a few years' time, they'll look fabulously shabby. One of the things you won't find in the dining room here or in anywhere in the hotel are buffets. I hate buffets. They remind me of recycled food. And everything we do at Seven Terraces is cooked to order. Even your breakfast is cooked to order. So we only use the freshest produce made in-house by our chefs. Luxuries at Seven Terraces are not an option or not an extra. Luxury is a way of life here. It's at no extra cost. And that's what I believe great hotels should be. Your experience of luxury should be part of your stay here. It's not an optional item. cannot talk about Seven Terraces and the, our business without talking about our events capability. And when I talk about events capability, I'm talking about my passion and my experience of living in the East and the West. Um, our capability in terms of our styling when you do an event here, you can entrust the style of the whole event to us and we will create the magic once you enter the doors at Seven Terraces. Between Colin and myself, F&B manager, we have over a century of experience living in both East and West. To be able to create that sparkle in your event. When you do an event here, you can take over the whole hotel. It's only 18 rooms in total, so before COVID, we had people fly in, all their friends from Singapore or Hong Kong, 
to just have a party here. I mean, it's so affordable, it's ridiculous. Basically, if you wanted to do the sums, it's when you look at the when you look at what it costs to put on an event, say in the crazy rich Asian scene, this would be like five or ten percent of the cost of doing that. So uh, it's very affordable, it's very stylish, and it's real. The heritage here.